to pay a couple respects to the people that made me what I am today. It's all my love. It's all my love. The quiet mind. It's all my love. It's Welcome to the Soul Patch Podcast, the podcast where three expats, uh, tonight just two, uh, discuss education, culture, and life here on the Korean Peninsula. I'm Jack, and I'm here with Ryan. Uh, Ryan, how are you doing this evening, man? Pretty good. I fixed my aircon unit. Yeah, I was going to ask pretty, you about I'm that. Pretty, I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, I think I told you before, we were having some issues here in the house. Uh, for people who maybe don't know what's going on this week, we're hitting record temperatures, right? Right. I mean, it's yeah. been, uh, I, I mean, it's been pushing 30, over 30 for a, a couple weeks now. It, we're, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, just, I get away with it. I get away with it pretty well in this house where we have some good... I don't know if it's the trees that are next to us or what's going on here. Mm -hmm. We've been able to avoid using a lot of aircon um, with the exception of our kitchen, which is, it's got a door on it. It's like se kind of separate room. What is it? Mm -hmm. separate room. Is it like a sauna and, when you walk in there? Oh get, man. Get it the... also, it has the thermostats in there. So you can actually yeah. see it. I got that sucker up to 36 degrees. When oh. I, was, I was baking in there. So, <laughs> yeah. There's no ventil the ventilation in there. The hood we put in, it's just garbage. It's not, it's not garbage, but it's just not, it's not built for this. We have three refrigerators, which oh, is. Oh, you got a bunch of machines running in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's, that's probably what's going on. So yeah. So I'm pretty happy to, it's just today. Um, I've got one, there's two air con units in this apartment and this one in this room in the studio hadn't been working. And I got it working and I'm nice and chill. Got my iced tea. You still like got the, uh, it still has some of that, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like Freon, I guess, the gas they put in there. Like it still had, I, it, it hadn't leaked out I'm, or anything? I, I'm, yeah. Well, I think the, the issue I had, though, this is probably more than listeners want to hear, but um, I had an outflow issue. So no, it was just an issue of cleaning stuff, basically. Yeah. That was mostly what it was. The, uh, yeah, the heat is, is killing me, man. I, I am not, uh, I do not do well in, I, you know, I'm from Minnesota, you're from Wisconsin, you seem to handle it way better than I, than I do. But, I, you know, I lived in Thailand for three years, I should be, you know, used to this. But yeah, I think you'd be more broken in than me. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm handling it that well. I'm, I've gone completely nocturnal just because I like to run, you know, it's my, yeah, yeah. My you could not run in the daytime. It's, You'll drop dead. You, oh, you can, you, you, yeah, you're, you're going to, you're be in the hospital with yeah. weather like this. Plus it's just no clouds. It's just bloody. So yeah, over here, we've been going to bed around four or 5 AM. Yeah. That's, that's uh bedtime. So I, I do my runs between 11 PM and 1 AM. Um, tonight I might actually pull it up a little bit earlier because it's a little better tonight. Right. Yeah, but yeah. even the even the nighttime. I mean, I'm looking at my the th my computer and it says it's like even right now it's seven o'clock at night. It's 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So I, I always think in terms of Fahrenheit because I'm American. We're uh, you know we got to do things yeah. our own way. But uh, yeah, I it, it's just been a real uh, it's been a heat wave. I mean, that's uh, the only yeah. way to describe it. So I, I also, I also use Fahrenheit when thinking about ambient temperature. And this is really goofy, right? Because I use Celsius for cooking. Oh I yeah. The re I have a reason. I'll, this is your defense, and you can, you can steal this. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's a good defense for it. Fahrenheit's more granular. Yes. It's more granular scale. So when it comes to the way you feel, I just think it's a better indicator. I like that it's just these little smaller degrees. So there's more but it's more nuanced right like there's a difference between uh you know 50 and 55 you know i mean there is yeah a, that's, that's what i'm saying yeah i agree with you it's it's it, you know um i, I can only Kevin always gives me, yeah. oh yeah Kevin gives we, me a hard time about this yeah. because he's always he's always making fun of me because i'm switching between scales because i also feel like for like running or for biking i i really like meters and kilometers because it's divisible by 10 you can kind of visualize it a lot more easily mm -hmm. so yeah I'm, I'm always flipping the switches and he's like you can't do that <laughs> you <laughs> got to choose that. one yeah you, you on american <laughs> bastard you know yeah, yeah uh, just, you're probably gonna start man. you start calling uh you know soccer football and uh, it's it's all a yeah, down, it's, it's a downward slope. slope man um yeah, well, no, that's I, the conversation for next week yeah that's, we'll, that's next we'll, week's we'll do a whole podcast on the metric system and uh the <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
So, so today, what I wanted to do uh, this week, uh, if the you know listeners of our podcast are probably aware that we we cover a lot of different topics. You know, sometimes we talk about culture, uh, sometimes we talk about education. Um, when you and I get together, it's we seem to we really like to to dig into the uh, the education uh, stuff and the methodology. And uh, I, I want to keep it relevant for our listeners out there who might not be you know not that might not want to dive in so deeply, but um, I think that some of these ideas are kind of useful for any classroom. And so I think, you know, those that are maybe uh, teaching English in Hagwon or something, but you, your major in university, you, you majored in something that's unrelated to education. Some of this, these ideas are kind of open up a whole world of, of uh, ideas when, for, you know, when it comes to actual instruction in the classroom. And so uh, what the, the, the things I want to talk about, the two ideas that I, I wanted to cover um, was uh, a kind of more standardized traditional syllabus where you have like a course book and you're teaching students a little mix of grammar, listening, some reading, some writing. You're covering all those, you know, all, all the big uh, aspects of the language, but it's a very, uh, what we would call a bottom up approach, right? You first, you got to learn uh, all the parts of the car and you got to learn all the rules of the road and you, and you, uh, before you ever get to drive the, uh, top down approach, which is, uh, something that we would call CBI, uh, content based instruction, or sometimes it's called CBL, uh, content based learning is, uh, where you kind of dispense with all the grammar and you kind of, and you just, uh, find something that the students are, are interested in. And your instruction comes from uh, your the the input that the students are receiving is almost secondary to the the content. And I, I have a definition here just so we can operationally define this, so that uh, as we go through the podcast, we're kind of uh, talking about the same thing. And uh, CBI refers to an approach to second language teaching in which teaching is organized around the content or information that students will will acquire rather than around a linguistic or other type of syllabus. So I, uh, I'm wondering if you, you know, do you have, do you have some experience with like a, a CBI? Um, Cause I, I, have, uh, I have some experience with it, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, and um, I have both, like, you know, my background came from doing research in education before I actually became right. a teacher, which some might say is backwards as well. But, uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, I just, as I said, it just didn't sound right. But yeah, that was my trajectory. Um, one thing for listeners and also, also just to sort of seed this conversation, something I want to throw out here. Um, there's a lot of what people assume is best practices mm -hmm. in many industries and certainly in education. Uh, many of these assumptions uh, actually are unfounded, especially with education, because the concepts can be so viral in nature. So something like saying um, there are different types of learners. You've heard of this. Uh, one of my yeah. um, favorite YouTubers, Veritasium, he did an episode on this not so long ago, and it just rang all these bells from graduate school. It's like, oh, yeah. Um, why, why is he making a video about this now? Why are we still talking about this? Yeah. Like you, okay. So for listeners that aren't familiar with this, you probably have heard something like this in your life. Like I'm a visual learner. I'm an <laughs> I auditory said that, learner. I used to say it all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's nonsense. Yeah, it's, that's, yeah. it's nonsense. It's yeah. based on zero science, but it's a really compelling concept. And I've actually seen that cited in papers. Mm hmm as if it's a thing. And then you find like, like a priority, citation, citation, it's citation, always citation, existed, citation. you know? Yeah. yeah, and you get down to the bottom of the rabbit hole, it's like, yeah. oh, it was just some dude who said, I think it was some guy in New Zealand who just like said this, like, <laughs> right. well, okay, yeah. So <laughs> there are some concepts you have to be a little wary of. And what uh, Jack has uh, just introduced here, this is something that actually does have some foundations in best practices. This idea of immersion or, um, the reason I wanted to preface this is because it, on the surface, if you are skeptical, this might seem like one of those things because it's very much mm -hmm. the method you would take to teaching a child something. 
the idea that if you distract the learner with fun, with something they can engage in, the the learner will more will open up and be more accessible. And this is this is a big way that you know you that parents deal with children. This is how we run you know kindergartens. You want to engage children first, and then learning will just kind of like come together. Mm-hmm. It's kind of based on the same premise, but there is um, there is research that backs this up. The, the, the idea of immersion is best practices. So, so you're, you're trying to say this is, is like woo. This is not woo. This is actual, <laughs> right? You know, it's because yeah. it sounds like it could be I just woo. It. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it's right. You know, uh, it's like a hippy dippy, you know, idea. And uh, that's my and point. You're doing it just because it's fun, not because there's any sort of you know like educational foundation behind it. So. Uh, exactly. I think that's good to bring that up. I, I definitely yeah. uh, I think that people have to understand this is different than I, I, I not to sidetrack us too much, but um, was the uh, the premise for like saying I'm a visual learner is uh, is is everybody is a visual learner, right? I mean, is that the the premise that that's why it's debunked? Is we all use different? We all use know, all of our senses right. all the time for all different types of things, and there's mm-hmm. tasks that are visual, there's ones that are more auditory. And you don't have, as far as we know right now, I mean, perhaps there could be some research that changes all this, but as far as we know right now, there's not like a category of humans on earth that preferentially learn things visually or Mm -hmm. auditorily. I I just think like I'm a visual learner is just what you say when you like watching movies more than reading books. You know, yeah, it's just it like I, maybe what you enjoy more. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd rather yeah. go to the theater and watch this and uh, I can back it up with, uh, you know, I'm a visual learner. Um, but uh, yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll go back to uh, what we're talking about. So uh, do you have any do you have some experience with like uh, creating a, 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 a syllabus or a class that was content based rather than uh, I don't, I, I don't know what the other word, I, the only, the best way, word I can use to describe it is traditional approach or the traditional method, which would, uh, which we already talked about, or w- which I mentioned before, but uh, I'm kind of curious if you have some experience with an actual uh, content-based class, like uh, maybe teaching speech class or something like that. I know you've, you've taught yeah, that before, absolutely. right? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Recently. Um, I actually, not so recently, I guess it was the first semester of 2020, that was last year, I taught uh, that speech course. And that's a common speech course that both Jack and I teach at Chumon. Um, you, you've taught it as well, right? Uh, yeah, I've taught the, the we call it, uh, it's called speech in English. In our, there's two levels, there's one right. and two. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so for this course, um, I had prior taught public speaking uh, in like the camps that we've done. Um, and there's many elements of public speaking that I do in my class always in my, my normal communications course mm-hmm. at Trinon. I always, I emphasize public speaking because I think it's a skill that's, you know, I can teach well mm-hmm. and it's very useful for young adults. So it's also confidence building, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a good, it's a, a thing that I've always focused on. So yeah. in the speech course though, I went through a process of selecting specifically a textbook that had things that I wanted to cover for that skill. Whereas in the communications course, we have a default textbook that, mm-hmm. I mean, I'll be honest, I use probably about 40% of it. Sure. Maybe that Yeah, much. no, you can't yeah. get through a whole book. I mean, that's... Uh... No, the book, the book is just there for themes and topics right. for you to guide your other um, lessons that you may... I mean, I shouldn't say that's what it is. That's how I run my course. Other professors, they might stick to the book. So... With a course like the uh, public speaking course, um, you're teaching skills of uh, persuasion, uh, improvised speech, things like this. And you're taking them through steps. And yeah, so you you write a syllabus that is like step, you know, I I need you guys to be able to accomplish this before we do this. It's all kind of scaffolded up. And um, yeah, it's pretty tight to the book. I mean, in that that situation i use pretty much all of the book yeah you know, and, and and in, in that kind of thing. in that scenario that situation the uh you're you're not uh there's not like specific grammar instruction in the book right i mean that's like you're you're giving instructions at the beginning of this of the semester i imagine you're kind of covering these different uh 
skill sets that they have to learn, like um, even just like brainstorming, coming up with ideas for your speech, um, how to create a, an opener that is interesting, that can grab the attention of the audience and stuff like that. I think mm -hmm. the, uh, the cool thing about content-based learning is, um, there, I, we talked about this a couple weeks ago in, the, in our podcast, during the instruction phase where you're just giving instructions, that is also educational. That's, that's a, there's a linguistic benefit to that, even though it's secondary to the, the, the main content of the, of the course, which is to teach them how to give a speech. But they're actually, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that is the whole, the whole premise of content-based instruction is that you're, like, like you mentioned before, you're almost like tricking the, uh, the, the students into uh, participating in, in, a, in language learning without actually, without anyone naming it. You know yeah, what I mean? It's kind, of a, it's kind of a hand, it's a kind of a hand wave thing. It's a fake out. Yeah. Like when I think of a lot of the activities that I do with the common course, the communications class, um, it breaks into like three parts. Every exercise I have has like three parts. There's the instructional phase and the students are feeling that I'm telling them what I want them to do. But what I'm really doing is I'm trying to, you know, we're practicing our listening skills. It's also a check for me. Second phase, they're actually engaging in the activity that I've instructed them to do. Now, this is like something where the students are engaging with each other. So they're conversation based, or maybe it's like a role playing type of thing or a game or something like this, mm -hmm. or it could even be a, it could be a writing exercise too. It could also be something solo. Regardless, during that phase, student's perspective, hey, I'm having fun, I'm doing the thing. I walk around the room and I'm watching, okay, I'm looking for our students who are confused. I'm making sure that I don't just jump in and help them, but I try to make sure that someone is explaining to them what it is they're supposed to be doing. And I try to make sure that that student is not using um, their language, but using the language of the course, which is English. Yeah, that's right? a challenge. So yeah, so it is, it's a big challenge. So the mm -hmm. student that is also explaining, they've got a challenge. They've got to work with uh, the words that they have and be able to relate it. I try, and wherever I find problems, that becomes part three. Then those are the students that I spend time with um, because they basically, you've done something like this, I'm sure. Like you have your activity going on and there's a student or students that just, they, either they don't understand the idea or they understand the idea, but their ability level is just behind the curve and they can't yeah. really participate actively. What you do is you pull up a chair, you sit down. And it's like, guess what? I'm your partner now. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that's phase three is where you can, I told you this before, I do this with um, those classes that have a lot of diversity in their skill level. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, I, I try to create um, time and spaces to work one-on-one -on -one with the students that are struggling because the course is from its opening, I'm serving kind of at the top, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like the exercise is going to be beneficial for everybody up to maximum skill level. And then I'm just looking for what filters out at the bottom and then I can go straight to them and spend some extra time with them. Right. So right. it's the same concept. So it's that one, two, three, you give the instructions, you let them try to engage and use, and then you look for uh, people that are glitching out and then you sit with them and you work them through the exercise. Do you, now with a, with a very diverse uh, classroom, like the way I, the way you have described your, um, and we'll just say your, your, uh, your, your, your main communication in English course, the, the course that is for uh, all freshmen, and uh, you get a, a, a whole variety of, of different levels. Some of them are, you know, you'll get a couple of outliers who are like native speakers. You get a couple outliers who maybe have difficulty reading, you know, just uh, reading text in uh, the target language. Um, and you always, you shoot from the middle, but uh, it sounds like, do you, do you kind of do like a hybrid? situation there where you're like you're, you're teaching the, the the speech aspect of your of your course is content based but uh when you get into the book is that more of the traditional approach where you're you're you know reading the the text and uh i I'm, i it sounds like there's almost like a you're almost doing like a, a hybrid in your in your communication in english course uh yeah. your general education to course. Be, yeah to be honest the the textbooks that we're, we've been using, we've only had really three different books over like the decade. Mm -hmm. um, 
I guess we're, so we're changing about every three years on average, but the ones we've had now I've had for a long time. The textbook, um, over time I've used it less and less and less and less and less. I could easily teach this class with no textbook. Mm -hmm. However, there are some things in the current textbook and I'm not gonna name drop that textbook because they get plenty of money. They don't need it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they I'm should name drop us. That. They yeah. could they could help us uh, on the flip side yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. of all the, the textbooks that I've ever reviewed for uh, for language, the this one in particular, I don't love it. But there are a couple things that are really nice about it. And one of them is the listening exercises. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I like the voice acting. They have a couple of segments that seem to be not acting, but actual mm -hmm. interviews. Uh, they have many different accents, the pauses and interjections and things like that. It's a very natural flow. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I really like in the textbook, the idioms and expressions. So they have a section of every chapter, there's one section where they highlight uh, some idioms and expressions for students. The reason I like those is because uh, it's, especially in Korea, I don't know why this seems to be the case, but they're, those idioms and expressions are very international and very contemporary. Mm -hmm. And I find if you go to like Kyobo or something, you, you find books that are like idiomatic English you'll find the lists yeah. that are are massive and it's but they're they're just a jumble it's like stuff my grandmother would say like, yeah yeah they're so dated it's, it's and not, yeah right not not universally uh, appropriate like you can't right. say this like in front of your boss but like uh, this is weird so yeah. the, i think the book that we're using currently it's it's it does a pretty good job of uh addressing what would be considered i would say like general contemporary international expressions idioms. So I, I like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'll highlight that and the listening exercises, uh, which is basically comprehension. So the the uh, textbook has an audio thing that comes with it. So I play that on the, the PA system or uh, in some of the sections, I just read out loud because there's transcripts in the book too. So students can read along, which is nice. Yeah, And we just do basic comprehension. I don't really use, no, I absolutely do not use any of the grammar exercises in the textbook. I have some grammar points that I teach, but mm -hmm. I do it myself. Yeah. I don't use the book. I don't think I ever have, uh, but I, I can see it being successful. They're laid out mm -hmm. well. Um, and the activities in the book, they have some like uh, group activities, speaking exercises, discussion questions. I absolutely use zero of those. I oh, you've have got them. your own, uh, yeah. Well, and, like probably you yeah. do too, right? That are no, I have for I, this demographic. It's interesting. My my experience with the the way I use the textbook for my now, I'll just explain a little bit to the to our listeners here how uh, how my classes are organized. I also teach a majority of general education classes, so it's a lot of freshmen uh, who are who have to take this class in order to graduate. Essentially, so it's just like. Uh, they're not volunteering to to join that class. They're they're kind of you know they have to be there because it's a liberal arts education and you have to be you have to do a lot of different uh, you know uh, basic courses. Um, on the other hand, I teach a couple of other classes or I have over the years um, speech and English, which is I would put that in the in the basket of content based instruction. That's that's straight up CBI. Um, I used to teach a class called uh, English in Film or English Through Film, something like that. And uh, that was, I, I set that one up also as completely content-based. It, uh, it was about, you know, uh, critiquing movies and uh, writing dialogues and, you know, lots of stuff that was related to movies. But, but it was, uh, you know, the focus was a language course. It wasn't supposed to be make you an expert about film. It was, uh, it was a way to, to study the language even though the focus is the language is secondary, uh, ultimately it was to improve your, you know, conversational English and just uh, get a, a way to practice it that's not so formal in such a formal structure. But uh, the way I teach my general education classes is, I, I think, much more of a of a kind of traditional approach where the book will introduce a grammar point 
and it kind of does this starts with the present simple and then it moves on to the simple past and then it moves to the uh, future tense and then you get into the more difficult tenses which would be like the perfect tense you know try teaching that too try explaining the perfect tense you know i mean talk about incomprehensible input you know like it's not it's you try to explain that it's it's yeah. almost it, that's why i i think that content based is is onto something although sometimes if the students are understanding your instruction, if you're just explaining the grammar and they understand it, then that's comprehensible input and that's useful to them. The problem is, and I think this is what you're addressing with, with some of your ideas is like, how do you get the students into a flow state? You know, I don't think anyone was ever in a flow state talking about grammar, you know what I mean? Or right. I like, right. I like the person that, you know, how many, the best case scenario is you get one or two people that are, super into grammar in a class of 30 students. I mean, that would be like, this is fantastic, you know? Um, but everybody loves to play a game of like charades or something, you know? I mean, that's that's yeah. more fun and interesting. And so, you know, and actually, yeah, this, keep... you know, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. You know. okay. oh. I was gonna ask you, you're the film class, I remember, I remember you telling me about this mm -hmm. when I, Oh, it was a long time ago. You talked about this. Was this like a film appreciation type of class, or do they exactly design their own? Do they make their own films? Um, I did. I, I did so many. Uh, there were so many different uh, incarnations of this of this class. You know, like uh, one semester, okay. I had them do. Uh, I, I had them do a documentary one semester, and uh, this is back in the days when it was like editing and stuff was was not as easy as it was now. Like this is like uh, YouTube yeah. was kind of in its like nascent stages of popularity. Like people sure. knew what YouTube was, but it wasn't, this is going way back to like 2010, 2011, 2012, around this time. Um, yeah. what, what we did have was the ability to, um, you know, show a movie on a big projector. So you've got, you're able to watch these movies um, on a kind of a, a big screen all together. And there's something about watching a movie as a group that's different than watching it by yourself. There's, there's a, it's just a different, um, there's a different vibe. And so I, what I wanted to, what I really wanted this to be is a film appreciation course where the students learn a little bit about the, the different jobs that are available in Hollywood and things like that. And again, this is, uh, I'm teaching this not so that I can, not so that the students are gonna actually become filmmakers. We're just using film as this like, uh, as, as the content to learn English, but the, the learning English was always the at the forefront of, of my mind. But I think it was, mm -hmm. it was probably in the back in the, in the background of their yeah, minds, you know, exactly, exactly. The, the, the reason I ask about the film is because during one of the camps that we had done with the public uh, speaking stuff, um, one of the early activities was to record the students would write a script they would you know select who's going to be the actor who's going to be the director and we had um, yeah we didn't use our phones we had camcorder do you call mm -hmm. them a camcorder they had nice camcorders yeah yeah. yeah yeah and they would record it and then um they'd be editing and we had a film festival whatever when we did this activity i thought it was fun but not very useful i saw a lot of students doing really not much there were students that you know basically had the one kid who had really good uh, writing skills, linguistic skills. And mm -hmm. he made, he translated everything. Everybody else was shouting at him. He made the script. Um, but everybody's mostly, speaking Korean to each other, you know, when it's- Yeah, they're all speaking Korean just to yeah. get their ideas out quickly. Cause it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, they're in that, they want to, they're thinking about the creativity of it. So they just get their idea. Right. And then when they uh, bolt together their performance, you've only got like two kids that are actually acting and speaking. And then you got the kid that is, has done nothing with language because he's the tech kid, the indoor kid that doesn't right. socialize, but he's great with cameras, right. great with software. So he's the editor, yeah, which yep. is fine. So, but it was, this was like a footnote to the, the rest of the program. And it was generally fun. We had a little film festival. So I was not like, I wasn't negative about that aspect of the, of the program. I thought it was just fluff. It was fun. And I would I, I encouraged us to keep it because you need to have that you need to have those fun moments because it mm -hmm. creates that um, that rapport with the group and that rapport is essential when the thing you're trying to teach is communication you got to make an environment where they want to communicate with each other right. naturally so I, I found it was good for that but as far as it being 
a, a practice experience or a learning experience. Mm-hmm. It just didn't check the boxes until, until I had a unique experience um, in that camp. And I want to tell you this because I think this is a valuable thing that any teacher could use. Um, so we were doing that exercise. It was a, a, I think it was like the next semester, the next, next semester when we had that camp. So the art camps are in the summer and the winter. So this was like in the summertime, I think. And uh, I had a group of students for this camp. It was quite small. I think there were seven or eight students. And so I had them in two groups uh, making two different films. And I had two rooms that I was running between as they're working on their stuff. And, you know, mm-hmm. this is like the end of the camp and we're all having fun. And, you know, you know, it's like donuts and coffee type of thing. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So and again, I'm, I have very low expectations for this whole experience. Uh, it was just for fun. And I went into one of the, one of the two classrooms and I had opened the door just to kind of check on them, see what they were doing. And I hesitated at the door in that group. I had, if you could picture it, four students. Three are, let's say, high level, conversational, um, very social. And the one kid that was also in the group, he was like, there's no way they would know who I'm talking about, so I can actually say this. Mm-hmm. He was kind of the dopey kid. Yeah, he was yeah, the yeah. big kid, the goofy kid, really shy, really shy, um, like six foot tall and chubby and right. shy and a little bit goofy, just really turned in. Mm-hmm. And he had a speech impediment mm. in Korean. He has a natural stutter speech impediment. So he was, I mean, it's such a small group. I have my sights on him from day one. And I walked into this room and the students were trying to get him to say one sentence Mm -hmm. that was it and they wouldn't quit they pushed and they pushed and they pushed they must have recorded that 20 times now is he just watch this he's 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 willing to do it like he's 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 into it he's not they're not like they're not bullying him right like this no oh it's very very positive yeah yeah positive experience and he finally nails the line they you know the guy shouts cut of course because they're dramatic and everybody just applauds, you know? Yeah. And so I'm looking at this. Yeah, it's a, it's a feel-good moment. I definitely felt really good. It's a fun story to tell. But it was an aha. I was like, okay, so check this out. Student who struggles with language, period, Korean, English, or whatever. Mm-hmm. You get a rapport going that's positive. Here you have an ex- this kid's having an experience. When else would he rehearse that expression 20 times? Yeah. And feel good about it. And feel good right. about it. Right? And come away with it from a positive experience. That, in, mm-hmm. that embeds that lesson. So I took that and put that into my regular class. So <clears throat> in my regular course, I did for a, a time, I haven't done it in the last like three years because there was other things I wanted to do. Sure. But I started having students make films in my um, current regular communications course. Yeah. And what I emphasize in that project is not writing a funny script or clever script or even the grammar within the script. I, I end up fixing all the mistakes just manually for them. Mm-hmm. I edit everything so it's all perfect. But what I emphasize is we need to have perfect emotional attachment to every phrase. Now, it mm-hmm. sounds like a pretty, like, what does that mean, right? But that's a huge part of language. It's yeah. having your inter- intonation land on the right words in a sentence, right? And it, it's not just, uh, you know, sounding angry when you're angry, but it's having the right emphasis on the verb right. versus yeah. the subject, right? Knowing when your intonation tells me, I know, you know, you, you understand what it is you are saying. Mm-hmm. So... Um, what's fun with video and especially because now we all have cell phones, we can record and review. Oh, it's so, so easy now. Yeah. I have this, yeah. So I have the students making the videos. I can go in and watch the video. You know, it's almost in real time. It's like, Oh, what do you guys got? going? Okay. Let me see that. Okay. 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 We got to look on that line again. And then I work with the student one-on-one just for two seconds. Like, no, it's not like this. You have to say it like that mm-hmm. because that's what you mean. Right. So, and then they rehearse it. We have a good laugh. It's funny because they're being emotional, whatever. But 
it's embedding that connection. And it's a fun, it's a fun exercise. I've always been looking for more uh, work the students can do that attaches emotion to the spoken language. Yeah. And it's hard to find. I've, I've surveyed coworkers. No, a bunch of times. that's not, it's not included in a, in, in a, a standard curriculum. You won't find it. You'll get, you'll get like a, they'll talk about stress, but I always found that very kind of uh, nebulous or it's hard to, to pin down. Like some of those lessons with like teaching stress and, and uh, I mean, I think it, it it's an interesting, this, we kind of saved this for like the, uh, the when we talk about uh, learning Korean, because I, I tell my students, it's like, I had a student say to me one time, teacher, when you talk, it sounds like you're singing. Because my, when I'm teaching, my voice is going up and down. Like you said, it's hitting these. And that, and that is, that is our, I've had students come and ask me, you know, I'm, I'm going to say hello to my uh, former uh, professor, former teacher, how do I, what's up, how do I say hello politely? And I say, well, you just say hello. And they're like, well, I couldn't possibly just say hello. That's, you know, or hi, I could, we well, could say hi too. I say that to them and like, hi, that's even more informal. Like how, how dare I say that? But I, I'm saying, I try to explain to them in English, um, intonation is where our, where, where our politeness is embedded. It's not so much yeah. in the well, and politeness and also intention. Your intention is in your intonation. Yeah. Right. So you can, I can tell your, right. Your emotional uh, register is, uh, is going to read very easily in English based on how you talk to somebody um, or talk to me or whatever, as opposed to the words that you use. And of course there are, you know, yeah. that there are limitations to what I'm saying. You can't just, you know, tell someone to F off. But if you do it nicely, you know, it's, it's how it's. It, well, yeah, sure. sure. Within a reasonable. But the, you know, back to, yeah, sorry, back to the lesson concept. Oh, just the lesson concept for, for sharing it with, with listeners that are, you know, potentially teachers. So this is something you could do with your cell phones. And, you know, it might sound like a bit of a project and it is, it's going to take a couple of weeks to get through, but maybe you're in a situation where you're teaching a class like Anna Hawk Wan or I don't know, or maybe it's just a lesson that you want to have one time, one day contained lesson. There's a, one similar exercise that I use. Uh, I still do it sometimes. Is the emotional dialogues. Do you know this one? No, I'm, I'm not this familiar. One? I haven't done it. No? No. Oh, this is so fun. Do this, do this. Uh, it's a, This one's from one of our coworkers. Um, okay. Again, not saying names, but he has so many great lessons. He, he gave me a list. It was for one of the camps. Uh, it's a list of really simple uh, dialogues, like a little couplet, where you want to call it, A, B, A, B, A, B. And it's really short, super, super short. So you can design this yourself. So if mm -hmm. at home, if you're thinking of doing this lesson, you can draw this yourself. Make a conversation between two people. Uh, each person gets four lines. So it's A, B, A, B, like, right? So, you know, eight lines total. Now, what you have to do is um, instruct the students to choose what type of character they're going to be. So like the dialogue is the same, but you want the students to get on stage and act if you want to go that route or they can do it you know, at their desk or just try to give an example or have them rehearse it and then they can make an example, whatever you want to do. Yeah. You know, make your own rules, be a teacher, have fun. But the, the idea is that like, I would say, okay, in this situation, um, this is a mother talking to her 15 year old son. Okay. And he just stole the car. <laughs> okay. Caught. Okay. I okay. See. And yeah, then they, yeah. they have to, they have to use that. Okay. Now the same dialogue, the same text. Now the situation is they're both pirates, you know, or like, you know, just change, change out the characters or yeah, now yeah. the situation is it's a boyfriend and a girlfriend, but it's the same dialogue. Um, if you're, if you're struggling to design it, I, uh, I bet if you just Google um, emotional dialogue, you'll get the lesson. I think this is a common ES. That's thing. a this is a great it's lesson. A I've never heard really of this practical. idea. Do they have like a simplified version where I, it almost like uh, you, you have the simple dialogue and then you could have students choose like uh, an emotion just for like a tired. You're tired. That's basically what it you're is. You're angry, you know, and something like that. And and so you can you could even simplify it for a class of. Uh, lower level students, maybe students that are not, uh, 
not yet fluent or whatever, they can still read the dialogue and they could understand the emotions. It sounds bad. Yeah, I'm looking to see. Maybe it's not so easy to Google. I thought I would just find like <laughs> that lesson sheet. But I mean, yeah. you could probably picture the idea. I mean, you could have it be like one is the cop and one guy's in jail. And then the next scene, it's like they're about to get married. And you so, can, like, and the students, and, and the more they, they, uh, the more that they get into these kinds of, when, when you, when you kind of, when you organize these kinds of ideas, I think uh, one of the, one of the good effects is that you're, well, there's something called the, uh, I think I mentioned this guy's name before, Stephen Krashen talks about the effective filter and, uh, and knocking down the, these filters which makes you more accessible for language learning. So it's like anxiety. How do you reduce the anxiety? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the ways to do that would be to get everybody participating in this activity, the emotional dialogues, where you're, everyone's kind of silly and embarrassed themselves. They're embarrassing themselves in, in a way because you're kind of standing in front of the group and you're, you have to act a little bit. Um, but once everybody goes through it, there's a kind of camaraderie that you've built. And so you've, you've knocked down one of those effective filters where you're, they're more accessible to actually learn the language because they're feeling less anxiety in front of these people. Because, and so absolutely. I think a lot of those, absolutely. yeah, a, a, lot, a lot of these things are not necessarily addressed in language classrooms these days. You know, I think people tend to, um, you know, they, again, it goes back to what you mentioned at the very beginning is like they think of these ideas as woo, you know, this is just hippy dippy stuff. And it's like, actually, yeah. anxiety is probably your number one uh, obstacle in your classroom, yeah. at least in, in Korea, yeah, because I, mean, I think lang in language, language is expression, it's expression, it's not mm -hmm. just the mechanics of like, a, of, a, of a written language or a spoken language, it's not the mechanics, it's not just the grammar. It's not just the spelling and vocabulary. It's, it's like, it, it's personal. It's a mm -hmm. deeply personal thing. Language is deeply personal. It's part of your ID. It's, uh, and you need, I, I open every one of my, my classes this way. My first lecture, the first thing I tell the students after I give them a little introduction, I'm like, look guys, this is a small group. We're very fortunate to have a small class. This is probably the smallest class you're going to have at, at uh, Chumong. It's a good possibility. You know, we, we run 20 student courses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, there's a reason for this. The reason for this is because you, I need you to help me. I need you to help me teach this class. I mean, I need you to be working together. If you don't work together, there's no benefit for anyone. And I know that sounds like a lot of responsibility or maybe that I'm like trying to throw the responsibility on you guys, <laughs> but it's a communications course, yeah. right? It, so the only way to do that is if everybody feels safe. One, another exercise, man, I keep thinking about that, that camp. We should really bring that camp back. There was another exercise early in that that I've used in my speech classes uh, called Walk of the Matador. Oh, yeah, yeah. Heard this I, one? I heard about yeah, this Yeah, you got to know this one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, really so this is a very it. early exercise. Yeah, yeah. 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 So this, this is a very early exercise. Very early. Like the if you're teaching a speech class or any communications course, this is like day day one. Day one. when Everybody's got their face buried in their phone. Um, you know, nobody knows each other yet. They haven't they haven't butted off into like their little friend circles and groups and stuff <laughs> right you know which is fine but but you want to you want to keep it all together you know you don't want to have teams in your room you want to have one team um so get everybody to do this one exercise it's really fast so you explain to the students okay look guys this sounds a little crazy a little dumb but it's gonna be really quick we just want to feel good being on this stage you see where i'm standing all right all right so this is a stage i've got all your attention all your eyeballs are focused here because i'm in the front now, I want all of you to be able to experience this. And what they'll do if students understand your, you know, if you communicated well, they're, you know, get the response is going to be like, oh, you know, I got to get on freaking stage. I'm like, look, 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 chill out, chill out. It's going to be really simple. In fact, it's, it's almost stupid. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to walk up. You're going to make your, you're going to walk up confidently. Right. Shoulders square. Shoulders back. You're going to walk face, facing the blackboard. You're going to turn around slowly. You're going to face the audience. You're going to breathe in once, breathe out once, introduce your name, and say thank you. So, hi everyone, my name is Ryan, thank you very much. And then walk slowly back to your desk and sit down. If you walk quickly, if you turn too quickly, I'm going to make you do it again. 
<laughs> and it happens. You get students that are squirrely. You know, they're they're nervous, yeah, right? So yeah, they're squirrely. Yeah. They kind of like yeah. they they scoot up to the front, you know, and they turn around, hi, <laughs> you know, hi, you know. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You wind that down. You're gonna relax. You're gonna feel good doing this. And it'll give you. It it, it helps break the ice. It is a chance to show it. This the stage is not my space. It's all of our space. Yeah. It really it really does help with that, and it also helps the teacher you to very quickly identify like where are the students that have been on the stage before we're the ones that this is going to be no no brainer we're the ones that who are the extroverts who are the introverts you know yeah. i mean it's exactly just, i don't exactly. need to worry about you and you're you just, you're going to be yeah. your comedian and on my attendance know? sheet yeah. on my attendance sheet i just make a little tick next to the names of people i want to work with yeah um yeah and then you can start you know pairing up students in the proper way you know so you, mm -hmm. you don't have uh the extroverts versus the introverts. You start getting those teams. You gotta, you know, keep all that stuff braided together. And it's easy. It's just such an easy exercise. You can knock that out with 20 students, 20 minutes. Yeah. Not well, this is, this is a great, I, I wanted to segue to one last uh, uh, point if you're okay to go a little bit longer. Um, I, got time. I, I wanted to talk about uh, group learning, like collaborative learning, because I, that's, that's another key to, I think my, uh, I, I was going to say my success as a teacher, but I mean, really, uh, every activity that I, the activities that I, uh, where I feel like the students are making the most progress, where actually we're really, we're really getting into that flow state where they're, they're interested and they've kind of forgotten that it's a class and they're, they're, they're using the target language. Um, this is, and, and it really is for me, it's all about group activities. It's pair work, it's small groups. And I'm just like, I'm always doing it. I mean, just everything is, is small groups. Um, I feel like the small group is, it, it, instead of just isolating one student and putting them on the spot, which I think is, is important to do, like you said, in that speech class, because that's what you're gonna ultimately have to do is you're gonna have to go up there. In a regular communication class, a uh, regular uh, general education class, um, I, I, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to the anxiety, and so I try. I'm, I'm, I try to create situations where we have a lot of, you know, make a lot of small groups, and then I give them some kind of task that they have to do, and then they have to work together. And so I was wondering if you uh, do. Do you ever use uh, information gap activities? Do you uh, do you know what those are? Um, no. So an information gap activity is where uh, you usually it, I make them, uh, I, I download them a lot from uh, a website. Um, I could give a shout out to the website. It's uh, teachthis.com. And uh, teachthis.com has uh, a lot of these great uh, information gap activities. And so what it would be is like, um, uh, I have uh, my piece of paper and I have some information that you need to complete your uh, dialogue or whatever. And you have information on your paper that I that I need, and we have to ask questions to each other um, in order to finish that. So let, let's say I have like a bus schedule, and you need you need to finish your uh, you know your schedule, um, and mine I want I need to finish my schedule. So we have to talk to each other. So I would ask you like yeah, when sure. when got, does uh, like the A train leave? And then your partner says, oh, it leaves at six o'clock and then I write six o'clock on my paper. And it's just a, a really quick, I, I would really recommend uh, if you have a, a, a classroom where you're trying to think, think of ways you can get the students to interact with each other, but, but you can use really specific grammar. You know, there's only one way to get the time, you know? I can either point at my paper and go, you know, yeah, time, time, you know, but I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. We're, I want you to ask the question. So what's the question? The question is when does the A train leave, you know? And so I help them with the grammar because English questions can be tricky, right? It's kind of like an inversion of yeah. the, uh, you know, subject yeah, and I verb. Like, and, I like that. I, I've mm -hmm. actually had more experiences with that as a student. So mm -hmm. learning, um, I took some Korean classes here at a at Korean Hogwana, Korean Academy. Mm. And the teacher used those um, exercises for me. For me as a student, they were really effective. Yeah. It was many of these phrases I had seen a, a, a hundred times. I use them in my flashcards, but actually having to apply it and I don't want to say rapid fire, but in real time, it's just like you have yes. to use it, have to use it, have to use it. Yeah. I, I find one of the things that I also would recommend for group work um, in an exercise like that or mm -hmm. any type of, of uh, situation where you're doing one-on-one -on -one, um, is uh, keeping 
I, in my mind, I just call it keeping blood flowing. So I'll take my classroom and I'll make them change their desks. So if you have desks, you can move. This is an easy thing to do. I make uh, two rows. So the desks are face to face um, and then face to face. So down the middle of the aisle, I can walk. That's like the students' backs are there, right? Oh, so you've okay. got like, yeah. you can picture that, right? So there's four rows yeah. of desks, face to face and face to face. And so the wide parts in the middle where I can walk up and down. So they're working with a partner on exercise like you just described or whatever. And then the students on the inside, I have them rotate one chair to their right, like a wheel. So the student that's on the mm. end that has no one on their right. They get to work they go with everybody the in next, their side of the... Well, they, they, no, they go to the next line. So the person on that's on oh, the okay. end, when they when they rotate to the right, there's no one on their right. They're at the end of the row. They mm -hmm. go to the row behind them. So it's like a wheel of people on the inside. The people on the outside that have their backs against the wall. Yeah. Those rows, they don't move. Oh, don't okay. So there's are. like a circle in the middle. So, I see. I, I get the idea. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, I, I use this. This just became a default. Um, I didn't really plan it. It just started working really well. Because when you're doing an exercise like you just described, okay, you can do that, but if you're not changing up the content, okay, like we're asking time, now we're gonna do something else. We're gonna ask for directions to the store. If you're not constantly changing these things up, or even if you are, it students can get into a pattern with somebody and it gets just boring generally. One way to make things not boring is just be like, I just set a timer for 60 seconds and it's like, it's fast. It's like 60 yeah. seconds, like, all right, get through your conversation or in my a lot of the exercises i have they're they're progressing they're, they're collecting information that's going to build something by the end and it's like all right one minute you're not ready too bad move 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 so they're always with a new partner it creates a little uh levity for the moment yeah, yeah. you want to say and you're you're also creating like, a kind of a, a a fake urgency i mean you've you've created exactly. like a it, it just a, yeah. just a you do like a pinch of anxiety to the stew Yep. which is you know yeah. I, I think is uh just makes it more fun because it's like steaks you know even though they're tiny little steaks mm -hmm. but they're just like i got to get this done before 60 seconds or else i'm not gonna be able to complete this and so yeah i i, mm -hmm. I like that idea I, I like creating that you know sense of urgency have, have you done the activity alibi oh yeah i love alibi that's one of my it's a yeah. classic it, it, you know yeah and it's using it's using that fake urgency so or you can, if you want to, you can run the rotations that way. So for listeners, if you don't know this exercise, this one, I know you can Google because it's gotta be. It's so everywhere. I can explain yeah. it really briefly. It's really simple. You, let's imagine a room of uh, 20 students are the easiest. So you put them into four groups. So you got uh, four groups. There's, um, no, I put them into five groups. So you have five groups of four people. Take one person from each group. Okay, you pull them to the front of the classroom. Now each of the groups has three people and you've got this new group of, um, what did I say? Mix up my math. Uh, five five students? people. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's, five, it's, it's five five pods, five groups of four people. You remove one from each group. So now each group has three people and you have on stage five people. Mm -hmm. You introduce them as suspects. Right. Uh, Yongija. They not, just robbed not, a bank um, or something, or they... Maybe, uh, maybe. Yeah. We don't know. We yeah. don't know what happened. And then you tell them a really simple story. So I always tell them the same story. I said, okay, guys, last night um, on campus, CCTV saw five people rob Uri Bank or mm -hmm. I don't know, Paris Big or something. Um, we don't know it's these guys, okay? This, the CCTV, it looked like them. Right. They're suspects. Make sure they understand that concept. Okay, they're going to go out into the hallway... And they're going to create their alibi, which if you're teaching in Korea uh, and you're new to this language, alibi is a great word because in Korean, it's also alibi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they know this, they can understand this very quickly. <laughs> so you take them to the hall, they're going to they're go in the hallway. I'm going to, I will help them develop their alibi. You guys, if you're sitting at a desk, your groups, each of your group, you are the police. So I'm going to go in the hallway and I'm, I will help them develop their alibi. When they come back in, you will be able to interview one person only. And you're going to get, we'll say, two minutes mm -hmm. to interview that person. After two minutes, you will interview someone else for two minutes. We'll keep going until you, your group has interviewed all five people. You're looking for inconsistencies in their story. So right. basically, can you break their alibi? So in the hallway, I go out there and I try to help them develop, you know, 
uh, reasonable alibi where they were, you know, at seven what did o'clock you eat? last night. You know, like, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. And they say their alibi was they're at a restaurant. That's always the classic one. They went to a movie and they have to have all the details, right? And then I come back in the classroom, like, okay, guys, they're working out there. I'm going to give them five minutes to build this. You guys, you need to make a good list of questions. Ultimately, if I gave you a half hour, you're going to break their story because, I mean, it's a game. They didn't actually. <laughs> you know, what color were the, you know, the waitress's <laughs> glasses or something, yeah. you know? Yeah, eventually, eventually it's going to fall apart. Yeah. But the trick is you only have two minutes to interview these guys. So you got to ask good questions. You might be able to fire off 10, maybe 15 questions. So what are you going to ask? And so then you walk around, you're helping them develop. And this is where you want to look at the grammar, make sure that they actually can make um, proper questions. Mm-hmm. And uh, and also logical questions, not like how many hairs in the head of the waiter, but you know, or how many forks. In the and, and this is a great That's exercise this. if you're teaching the past continuous tense, especially like, yes, what yeah, were you doing exactly. at this time? You know, I mean, this like, so you can always tie this into, you know, the grammar that you're, that you're covering. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and again, you're just slipping this in. You're just slipping right. this in. You don't even have and to the, tell the them what it is the past not continuous. Even, just... They're not even aware of it. They're yeah. not even aware of it. And so, yeah, because, you know, you're going around, you're helping to <clears throat> refine their questions so that, you know, you can cover that grammar point specifically or whatever it is else is you want to be doing. But even then, when, let's say you missed a group, maybe there's one group where you didn't correct all of their, their questions perfectly. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Don't sweat it. You can keep helping as the activity goes. So you bring the students back in. They're being interviewed by each group. Walk around and listen. What you'll end up noticing is in a group of three people, maybe one student keeps glitching. They're not getting the question right. But you'll notice one of their students is getting it right. And suddenly that student who wasn't getting it right starts to change the way they say it. Right. They're starting to just imitate. And if you see, you know, obviously in situations where it's not happening, you can walk up and just be like, oh, you know, and fix it. And more than, more, than, more than imitating, it organically it's, come. oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, no, I was going to yeah. say they're, they're internalizing it, the grammar, actually. Yeah. I mean, that, and that, cause that's what, yeah. that's the ultimate goal of what we're, we're trying to do here. I think with, with language instruction is I, I don't want to, I, I want you to take these, I, I want you to take an idea and I want you to uh, apply it to, so, it, you know, I, instead of saying, you know, like yesterday I played basketball now change it to study and uh, math. Okay, yesterday I studied math. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and then, you know, you get a student, maybe it says, yesterday I go to the store. And I said, oh, that's a great. You're actually, you know, you're, you're taking that rule and you're applying it. Now you've, now in this case, in English, we have something called irregular verbs. And so there's a little teachable moment there. And you say, oh, instead of saying go, we say went. Mm-hmm. But, you can, but you can see how you're teaching them patterns of language because you couldn't possibly teach them every word in the dictionary. It's not possible, Mm -hmm. but we don't need every word to learn a language. You just need a a small amount that gives you, lets you recognize the patterns that they can apply it to larger structures and, or, or, you know, multiple words, verbs, and, 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 and that's, that's communication. I mean, that, when you see that happening in real time, it does kind of warm your heart a little bit. You're like, wow, yeah, well, it, well, it's, it's so effective. Cool. And uh, for teachers listening and people that have studied um, education and got into teaching, which is probably most people that are listening that are teachers or new teachers, you're probably um, in the lesson plans that you've been taught to design and the ones that you've made, if you're playing it by the book, you need to have some sort of uh, checkout. You know, that's always part of a lesson is that you're trying to present a skill, practice skill, and then check out the skill, make sure, you know, find out who mm-hmm. caught it, who got it, and make sure that nobody got left behind. I, in our courses, you know, the, our common communications courses, they're meeting either twice a week for 75 minutes each or once a week for a couple hours. But the, the regardless of, of that, I find that the checkout is often wasting too much time in my class. I'd rather have them being productive mm-hmm. and save those checkouts for later, turn it into a quiz or just throw it into your, your midterm or your final or whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a small class of 20 or less students, you're intimate enough with the group. You can be following, you know, who's, who's dropping the ball, who needs help. Um, yeah, I just, something I really suggest because that checkout, I mean, that could run you 15 minutes minimum in a 75 minute class. That's a huge chunk. That's a huge chunk of time. Right. And why would you want to cut something 
beautiful, like, uh, you know, where, where students are, yeah. are actually engaged in a game of, of alibi, just so that you can cover some, you know, grammar points and, and review, you know, something that they're starting to internalize already. It, it's their intuition yeah. has taken care of that. They may not even re realize it and it may not stick. Yeah. It might take a couple of other more classes, you know, more opportunities for them to, to internalize it um, completely. But uh, exactly. And if you see that, if you see that towards like the, the end of the exercise and you're like, oh man, I'm not feeling confident. I don't think this got through. I don't think my, my, I don't think this was an effective lesson. Oh man, maybe I should check this out. No, 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 no. Just mm -hmm. make it pull another lesson with the same, same concept and run it the next week. Just yeah. Until they get it. Yeah, I, I, I've, got, I've got one last uh, thing that I, because it's like, we're, we're kind of talking about our, our go-to activities and, and something I find really effective and simple is doing surveys. Do you do surveys in your classroom? I'll do like- uh, Yeah, so give me an example, like what? Uh, so for example, uh, we'll do like a food survey. So, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be, and you could use this for like, um, they're really good for like uh, teaching the present perfect uh, when you're talking about experience. So have you ever? So it'd be like, uh, you know, have you ever eaten, um, I don't know, uh, tacos or whatever? Um, and then if they say yes, then you have a follow up question. Uh, when did you, where did you, or, you know, whatever, it could be a where or why question. And, uh, and what I do is I give a little square has the two questions. So they just have to read the question and they have to ask 10 people the same two questions. And then you, got, you finish, you've talked to them, you've asked your question, they've responded, you write down your data, then you have to go and you have to give a little presentation. You have to present your findings. What did you find? You know, okay. What percentage of the students in this class have tried Mexican food? How many of them have tried Mexican food? Oh, 50%, that's interesting. And uh, maybe uh, uh, where, and uh, would be an interesting question to like, where did they try this? You know, Itaewon, was it in Mexico? Was it, you know, and, and you can get a feeling and it just tells you, you learn a little bit about the students in the class. And it's just a, it's just a fun way to very simply, I mean, it works for, you could make a survey out of anything. I, uh, I, I visit a website, uh, I'll give a shout out to this website called Boggles World. It sounds uh, funny and silly, okay. but they, Boggles World has a ton of these little surveys and they're fantastic ways to just, if you want to get students to interact with each other, um, it's a, it's a great way to just, you know, it's a, we call this a, uh, I think it's called a cocktail activity, a mingling activity or cocktail party mm -hmm. activity where everybody's, yeah. you know, walking around with their cocktail, like you're at a party and, you know, you're, you're introducing yourself to all these people. And, uh, and that's tough for some students to do. And so I'll, you know, inspire them to, Hey, come on, stand up, stand up. Let's, let's walk around a little bit. No, you don't need to sit down. Let's stand up. And I'll put two people together. Say, so ask him your question. Okay, and they ask and then, oh, now it's your turn. You ask and you just kind of force them to do it until they start to, you know, kind of get the, the hang of it. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, there's, there's a lot of these strategies, you know, alibi, uh, surveys, uh, information gap activities, um, making a film, a film project. Um, these are, oh, man, are I, great I can keep ways. going. I'm, this is just yeah. the tip of the iceberg, man. I got so much stuff. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a really fun conversation. I didn't realize where this was going to go today. I haven't. I haven't, I mean, I, I think about my lessons all the time, right? Uh, but it's, you know, especially since COVID landed, I I'm not in the office. I'm not, no. I'm not discussing my concepts that often. This is really fun, man. Yeah, yeah, this man. Cool. I, I'm glad, you know, this, I, I'm going to use that uh, emotion activity for sure. I, you know, with COVID is- a I'll whole... look and see if I can find it. It's got to be in my Google Drive somewhere. And I, I could I could probably uh, whip it up on a Microsoft yeah, doc do so quickly too. And, and uh, yeah. but it's such a- I think the best ideas are the simple ones. I mean, it's just a, a mm -hmm. simple idea is always going to be, it, it, you know, if it takes you 45 minutes to explain how to play the game, then it's, it's probably <laughs> too complicated. But, uh, but if it's, if it's fun and, and simple, I, I'll, I'll, we should think of some more and do another, uh, you know, idea share. That's what basically our podcast oh, turned yeah. into an idea share kind of, but uh, for our yeah, teachers out there, I think it's probably valuable. appreciate it. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's some value, and especially that uh, well, when Kevin gets back here, you know, three of us collectively, how many years of teaching experience do we have? Forty. Oh man, yeah, I, I think it'd be funny to, uh, <laughs> to compare time. our activities together and see how many of them we've shared with each other. Because I, I guarantee you, you know, over the over the time, I've uh, you know, I've I've stolen so many ideas from 
other teachers. I mean, that's where I've gotten all yeah, my stuff. That, is like that's a great one. I'm taking that, it. You know. Yeah, that's that's definitely where we should we should steer this conversation soon. Maybe we can maybe the week after next or something we'll come back to this because um, over the years, more like more recently, uh, Kevin and I have our desks like face each other. We're in the office pool. As you yeah, know. yeah, so like, right. You, you, office pools are, I've been to your like, office. I, with, yeah, you guys are facing yeah, each other in a yeah. cubicle. Yeah, yeah, we always have been. Um, well, not always. I think the first building we didn't. It's like our third building. Um, but anyway, uh, so Kevin and I have always been really social in sharing our lessons. And in the early days, of course, it was just piles of just, Hey, if you tried this, have you tried this? How effective was that? And, and you're, you're working on stuff. He, he said this last time that we were all together on the podcast. He's like, I said something about the, um, haiku uh, syllable thing. He's like, I said, Oh, that's yours, Kevin. He said, Oh, actually, I think you or you stole it from me or I gave it to you, but you improved it. And I was like, I don't even know. It'd be fun <laughs> right. to see how far we've taken some of those early lessons from a decade ago. Oh and yeah. Where they've evolved to, you know, that would um, be, that's fantastic. I, really I, I, should, I would doing. love to go back and look at, I mean, I used to get, I, I used to get way out there when I was, especially when I was immersed in my, my master's degree program, I was just like ideas were, were just flowing. Like, uh, you know, it, I was just coming up with so many ideas uh, as I've gotten older, as I've, the longer I've taught, I get more set in my ways, you know, a little more curmudgeonly. Yeah, and easy. so I've just got like my go-to <laughs> activities that are just kind of classics now. Um, I play the hits, you know, uh, uh, you know, but yeah. if it works, you know, it's going to get, it's going to get, get out of that funk though. Like, I, I think I do the same thing. It's like, and it's, there's a good reason for it too. Like, you know, you're trying to get a concept across Well, you got to use the way that works best. And after, you know, a decade of experimentation, you kind of know how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. But I think just like for a learner, for a student, being engaged is the most important thing when trying to learn a new concept. For a teacher, the best way to be teaching that concept is also to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I worry that lessons that I've taught for many, many years, I have them autopilot now. I, I haven't brought notes to a class in about six years yeah like, I don't know anything. i've got like basically uh, memorized uh, uh yeah you're it's, right it's, it's like when does it become stale and if i'm stay if i right. feel like it's stale then they're also going to notice that they're going to feel that uh uh you know tiredness yeah you're you're rattling off more, like you're, yeah. you're giving instructions you're giving instructions and you're rattling them off really quick just because it's like this like rote memorization it's like whoa, wait, 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 wait. these are totally new people that have no idea what's going on you know do you yeah, ever get, I, I, I get to the point where it's almost like I, I, I could like my body could leave. I just like one, one body's yeah. teaching, you know, and then the <laughs> other one is kind of like talking about looking at basketball scores or something, you know, it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Your brain is like over here. Yeah. It's on I'm autopilot. Guilty. I'm guilty. And, yeah. Yeah. It's like, That's wow, was I just talking? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Until you forget that you're, you realize that you're just go blank, you know? But uh, I would love for those yeah. to have those problems again. That means we're back in the classroom and COVID's done. So <laughs> good Lord. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Um, it's all right. Coming. I'm going to just going to close her out here. Uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, also, uh, you know, hit the like button if you like the video. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher, uh, Amazon Music. Um, if you really want to help us out, leave a review in Apple Podcasts. That really helps us. Um, it does something with the algorithm and, and uh, gets some more uh, ears uh, on our podcast. So uh, please do that. And uh, if you want to you know, talk to us, um, if you have an idea for uh, a, a, an episode, uh, send us an email at thesoulpatch at gmail.com. And that's S-E-O-U-L, thesoulpatch at gmail.com. Uh, we'll reply to all emails. Uh, I'll read your email on air. Um, I think I made that promise that the next person that sends an email, I will read it. So please uh, send us an email and uh, take care, everybody. We'll catch you next week at the patch and uh, hopefully we'll be in, a, uh, we'll have a full, uh, a full team next week. So uh, see you then. Thanks everybody. Thanks Ryan. All right. Good night. It's all my love, it's all my love. The quiet man, it's all my love, it's all my love.
dopamine. Jim. The brain. Hey, Bobby. Let the bass go. 